first do no harm. Ugh. So, and most docs don't understand that when they put them on birth control pills, they're creating a catabolic state. And what are you gonna do to get them out of that? So how do you prevent the number one killer in the world and in the US, heart disease? We're going to talk to a TRT specialist about the link between testosterone and heart disease and how you might be able to mitigate your chances of having heart disease. Dr. Rob Kobinarek, is it right? And uh, happy to have him here. He, this is a um, really, really great guest to have. I'm really excited. And we're gonna talk about the link between you know, essentially testosterone, low testosterone, heart disease, improving your testosterone, how it improves heart disease, and all sorts of other topics related to it. So hi, Dr. Rob. Yes, great to be here. <laughs> Super excited. I'm yeah. gonna finally get a chance to do something Excellent. together, which is, this is outstanding. This is great. So firstly, we need to say that Dr. Rob has been treating testosterone for about as long as I've been on testosterone treatment, which is 27 years. It's been a little while for sure. Yeah. It's been, it's been a, quite an interesting journey. I never thought that my career would actually take me down this path. And uh, if you'd like to hear that story, yeah, was, please. Yeah. it started back in 1996 when I was putting together an urgent care for a hospital system and a young man had pulled out in front of a car on a motorcycle and got T-boned, oh. skipped off the A pillar and we packed him up, sent him to the hospital. And it was several months later, he actually showed up in the clinic complaining of, you know, I just don't feel good. Like something's not right. I feel weak. I just don't, I don't feel good ever. And it took a couple of appointments to go, oh, you were the guy that skipped off that car. Yeah. And in the process, he had fractured his pelvis. He had lost the testicle. And in surgery, they had to take the other testicle. So he had no testosterone. Ooh. And if you can imagine, 1996, really kind of, Internet's just getting started. We're on mm. dial-up. Takes forever. There's really no yeah. information there. <laughs> so I did what you would normally do. It's go to the textbooks and see what the answer is. And you have Harrison's textbook of internal medicine, andrology, you know, sex ed kind of books. And it's the same paragraph. Testosterone, cypionate, 200 milligrams IM every, every two, two weeks. weeks. I'm like, okay, I guess what I'll do. But So I, I called the urologist just to check on things. And he like, I don't do that. Call an endocrinologist. I call the endocrinologist. And he goes, you know, testosterone, cypionate, 200 milligrams. I am every two weeks. Click, hangs up on me. So I'm like, okay. So I give the young man his testosterone, right? Yeah. And feels good. And he feels bad. He feels good. And then he feels bad. And I'm like, this is a miserable way to live. Yeah. So I was working out in a local gym and I knew there was a bodybuilder there and I knew he was taking steroids. Yeah. So I went and I approached him and I said, <laughs> hey, listen, how do you take this stuff and not feel bad? I've got this you know, young man who's lost his testicles and I'm giving him testosterone. He feels good for a little bit, then he feels bad. And there really just was nothing in the medical textbooks. And he says to me, uh, well, here, this is what I take. And he unscrews the lid to his protein powder and he pulls out this peep, piece of paper and he shakes it. And he's like, I take testosterone, cypionate, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And I take this and I take that and clenbuterol and DMP. And I'm like, what are we doing? I don't want to do that stuff. I just want to know about the testosterone. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, you take it three days a week. Yeah. So this is 1996. So I'm like, I immediately go back and I get into my office. I get my PDR out. And I start reading about cypionate and everything about it. And I'm like, Okay, so you know, three days half life. Okay, let's let's, let's do this. Let's right. give it every third day. But I lowered the dose way right. down, and then kabam, he feels better. Like he's, I just feel good all the time. Is, and that right there did it for me. I'm like, whoa. There's a lot of doctors, even in the United States, there no. are still doctors that no. will swear that oh, the half life of cypionate is 10 to 14 days, and that's how you have to give it. I said, but if you lower the dose, half life is only based on the quantity that you're giving. Mm -hmm. That's what's been tested on, or assumed to be. Right. But yeah, that's so what I caught on that whole interaction <laughs> with the with the bodybuilder at the time was like I'm so we're gonna go from 200 milligrams, you know, one cc. I'm right. gonna drop it way down. I think it went 0.2 is where I started. Okay. But the light bulbs went off, and then the curiosity, and I've always been very curious. I'm like, where am I gonna go with this? Like, this really seems like uncharted, unexplored in a territory because nobody seemed to have any knowledge really about it. And so just one patient after another, I started taking different approaches and it's been a, a 27 year journey. Where it started for me to where I'm at now, it's like vastly different. And I even think back just 10 years ago and what we knew then to where we, we are, are now, now, what we know now, I'm just super excited to see where we go in the next 10, 10 years. 15 years with this because now we're getting just so very specific and fine tuned with our therapies. To help men and women 
And we'll see. there's still a lot of changes that definitely need to occur. And I'll say in the industry, right. because there are those that are out there still throwing like everybody the same protocol, which really doesn't work. And that's well. not bespoke TLT. No, it, it really, all therapies, regardless of what they are, really need to be an N of one. We need to be treating the individuals because they have individual needs. How one man reacts to testosterone versus another man is going to be completely different. So to say that you know every man should be on ex exogenous testosterone, that's not really the case, but every man does need testosterone. testosterone. How are we going to optimize their levels? How are we gonna get that percent free high enough to get physiologic difference? So that we're mm -hmm. getting hormone you know, across the, you know, from the angiogen receptor down to the nucleus. We're getting translocation, transcription mm -hmm. of the hormone so that we're getting physiologic effect, right? So obviously there's so many iterations of different protocols that you can do, but there's usually a starting point, I guess, based on certain criteria. What would that mm -hmm. criteria be for you? What are your starting points for treatment normally? I mean, so I, that's a really great yeah. question. And I, I don't have a set protocol that I use. So if an individual comes to me, how old are they? Yeah. What kind of medical disease problems do they have already? What are their goals? Am I dealing with a 19 year old that took bought SARMs off the internet and has <laughs> yeah, interrupted their hypothalamic pituitary testicular axis and they're having all kinds of negative consequences? Or are we talking about a 65 year old man that's had two or three major adverse cardiovascular events yeah, and I want to prevent other events. Yeah. So my treatment paradigm is going to be very different depending on the person that I'm working yeah. with. And is it a woman? Is it a younger woman? Is it a 22 year old female on birth control pills who under eats and over exercises, over stress, her sex hormone binding globulin is through the roof and her testosterone is nil and she's completely catabolic, the completely different approach I'm going to take with that patient. And yeah. there's so many different avenues to say that there's a cookbook and that's why I have an issue with like the cringy testosterone clinics that put everybody on the same thing. Yeah. That's just irresponsible. So I know at uh, Balance for Hormones, you have a di different variations and obviously different people. You look at their SHBG, like you said, you look at does the patient want to inject? Maybe they would prefer creams because they're needle phobic. Maybe mm -hmm. the patient doesn't want to be doing more frequent dosing or wanted to do a little bit less. Maybe they do want to do more frequent dosing. We have to look at the whole picture. And you're right, based on, on, the, on the health. So you know, I leave that to the doctors. They, they decide what they want to do. There's a myriad of different yeah. delivery methodologies. And any doctor can make those work, whether it's pellets, injections, patches, creams, yep. gels oral, sublingual. There's so many different delivery methods and any and all of them work. And it comes down to what's going to work best for the client. But if I'm dealing with an 80 yeah. year old woman, I just want compliance. Whatever I can do to get her to take it every day. Am I going to always get optimal levels? Mm, maybe not, right? Because I'm going to have yeah. compliance issues versus someone who's 40 years old, who's very disciplined and consistent. And we can take we can go down uh, different pathways and we can use different delivery methodologies to optimize therapy, right? It's just that there's a, everyone is different. different and everyone has different motivation and different goals. Yeah. My goal for me working with clients is optimizing their overall health and wellness to extend their health span so they have a very long lifespan. In the diseases that we worry about, and as metabolic diseases really have taken over and drive heart attacks, strokes, mm, so you know, right. cardiovascular disease being the number one cause of death in the United States, you know, and then right behind that, we're dealing with cancer and then neurodegenerative diseases, which are all oh. driven by metabolic disorders, right? So metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, out of control diabetes, prediabetes. My goal as a physician is when somebody comes to me and they, Oh, you know, I'm getting fat around the middle. Right. And I feel weak. I just don't I know get up and go, no erectile folly. Those are all red flags to me that there's cardiometabolic disturbance. Okay. And then here comes the teaching. How do I pull them from there, just being you know, focused on the vanity part yes, of it yes, that's right. to, hey, I want to keep you from having a heart attack or stroke. That's really what this is about. How hormones can help prevent and mitigate heart disease. Or if you've already had a major ad adverse cardiovascular event, how do I keep you from having okay. another one? Because that's what's going to get you. You know, one in three men in a room, one of us is going to die from a heart attack or stroke. And there's three guys in this room right now. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. So who is it, you know, and over the age of four, for women, it's one in like but 33. Wait, wait. We're kind of a different 
part of the population. I think we're not representative. Yeah, we're yeah. probably all in the more fit. Yeah, level. we're probably okay. But for women, it's about yeah. one in 33. Premenopausal, postmenopausal, it's right. one in 2.8. Yeah. Why? They lose that beneficial so protection of estradiol, yeah. right? Which gets converted into free fatty acid. Oh, well, same thing for yeah. men as they age. So sometimes you can look at how low the estrogen is where they might benefit from treatment. If the mm -hmm. estrogen's too low, usually the testosterone's too low. Oh, you're yeah, converting, absolutely. So they, you're going to have an issue there. So one of the areas we, we said we're going to talk about is, and they started going to the, on the cardiovascular side, but many in the more mainstream, well, I wouldn't even call mainstream, kind of the old school, old fashioned, sometimes will, will demonize the testosterone. And, you know, as I mentioned, I was in that, that article in the Daily Mail, it still called the Daily Fail, that testosterone, man on testosterone for 26 years or 27 years, mm -hmm. you know, leading to blood clots and, and all these sorts of things because he wants a Love Island body, which is completely false. That's not the case. But, I mean, what do you say to those detractors that, that say that the testosterone will cause you blood clots? What I find is when I run into these kind of individuals, yeah. they are not up on the current latest data yeah. and what that reflects. And it tells me when they say statements like that, that they're not. So my goal is to steer them in the right direction, to educate them so they truly understand that their understanding of the material is incorrect. So for a cardiologist to say, and it's my opinion, hmm. every cardiologist should be an expert at testosterone so optimization therapy. And why is it? The data is very clear. Even in their own literature, the American College of Cardiology, mm -hmm. they talk about the benefit of optimized testosterone levels in the prevention of major adverse cardiovascular events. And for those that have had them in the past, it's preventing second, mm -hmm. you know, subsequent ones. So it tells me they have a lack of understanding of the data that's out there. And they're, they're just basing their opinion off pre-existing myths, right, and very old data. Yeah. Well, it would have changed that. I think you're doing great work. One so, person at a time. Yeah, one, but I don't know, maybe if you were in the lecture hall earlier today, there was one person that was persisting based on very old thinking and data, and, and her, her premise was just incorrect. Oh, I heard about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, it's like, ooh, you're kind of dangerous, honestly. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, you know, like where we are in the UK, there's still lots of people on the NHS. We get patients. Uh, you know, that will say, oh, my GP says I should be on this. It's going to cause me to have a heart attack or stroke. And we have to fight that fight every rubbish. day. I know, Absolutely I know. rubbish. <laughs> and, and, I, and the data shows otherwise. Yeah. And so generally when I'm having a consultation with an individual, I don't tell them what to do. Yeah. What I do is I lay out the data in front of them. This is you. Say, for example, you're a 62-year-old man who's had a previous heart attack. Okay, well, I'm going to lay the studies out. Mm. Randomized, controlled, double-blinded studies. And... You tell me which group do you want to be in? Do you want to be in the group that had high levels of testosterone and decreased risk from subsequent major adverse cardiovascular events? Or do you want to be in the group that got no testosterone who died much faster? That's right. Which group do you want to be in? And that study was repeated. It wasn't one of those studies that used suboptimal levels of testosterone. And said, so look at all these people that had cardiovascular mm -hmm. events. Yeah. And, so and, underdosing, yeah. right, can be as bad as overdosing. Dosing. There is there a sweet spot? There's an individual sweet spot for every person mm. because we all have different genetics, right? So if we talk about CAG sequencing. I was just going to ask you that. Yes. Right? Yeah. So, you know, the shorter that CAG sequence, they the, the less you're going to need. The yeah. longer the CAG sequence, the more you're going to need. So and how fast do you metabolize? I'm a fast metabolizer. I'm like, you know, chew through things. And then other people are very slow metabolics, lower dosage, not so much, not as often. And, and they do just fine. And that's also linked to SHBG as well, how mm -hmm. fast it's going to bind and stay with you and, or how quickly you're going to excrete it. Because we've seen that in low SHBG patients, you know, a certain dose, they'll be in and out of the system much faster than some of the larger SHBG. So it's really interesting you mentioned the CAGRI piece, because I've been saying this for a very long time. It's in some of the guidance from the ISSAM, the International Society of Aging Males. That, I mean, should this be used as partly a screening tool? Because how often do you find those patients who have all the symptoms of low testosterone, but they fall within the normal range? Could they have very long CAG repeats? And, and, and <laughs> we know that yeah. long CAG repeats means that they're going to need more testosterone to overcome their yeah. symptomatology. And that we get with experience. There's no real way to test for that right now that's inexpensive and usable yeah. in, a, in a clinical setting. Yeah, because I've also so, a lab and they're like, uh, I sent them the papers and yeah, they're like, like, well, we can get you the added receptor genome sequencing, but yeah, yeah. currently it's just not possible. <laughs> it wasn't cost so, effective. you know, there are guys like you're a much bigger man than I am, right? But you may require less testosterone than I do. 
and it has nothing to do with the, the size, size, but it has everything to do with the genetics. Yeah. Right. And so I'm going to treat you as an individual. Nice. And how am I going to optimize you? And in my goal, I want to prevent cardiovascular disease. I want to prevent you from getting cancer. I want to prevent you from getting a neurodegenerative disorder or metabolic disorder. Yeah. And we know that optimizing hormones, testosterone, growth hormone, DHEA, pregnenolone, all will help combat metabolic disease. So what is it about testosterone? I mean, I think one thing that comes to my mind that, that helps prevent cardiovascular disease, is it part of the vasodilation? Or is that just one bit of the whole picture? So if we take the average American male in the yeah. United States, in Ohio, for yeah. example, because I'm located in Ohio, right? They're overweight. They've got a 38 plus inch size waist, right? And they've got all that visceral adiposity, which mm. is toxic, releasing all those inflammatory cytokines, right. which are doing all the damage to the vascular endothelium. So if we get down to the artery, and inside that artery, we have a nice lining, and that lining is covered with something called the glycocalyx, this hair-like structure, which is actually a gel that protects the lining of the artery and the endothelium mm. and the secretion of endothelial nitric oxide. And the mechanical hydrostatic forces, say from high blood pressure that damages, the sugar which damages the glycocalyx, that exposes and denudes that. And then we get gapping in the tight junctions, and then that oxidized cholesterol travels through the tight junctions and gets trapped. And then we start to build athromatous oh, disease right. in the arteries, right? And so testosterone helps us get rid of that visceral toxic fat, and it does it very quickly. Oftentimes, I'll, I'll have individuals such as this with metabolic syndrome, and they'll come in, I, I put one I think on Instagram recently, where his uh, hemoglobin A1C was 11.8, and within a year, we moved it from 11.8 to 5.7, and in the good. second year, 5.7 yeah. to 5.2, off all his diabetic medication completely, and it's testosterone. Now, in the United States, it's not indicated for the treatment of metabolic syndrome. However, it works wonders if it's the right patient. And he responded very well. We've reversed his disease process. We pulled all that visceral, toxic, inflammatory uh, uh, fat off of his belly. Now his waist is down to a 32-inch waist. And all these other parameters start to come in, in the line. Yeah, Testosterone yeah. is an incredible tool to help us combat metabolic syndrome. So it also gave him like the Philip to actually do the exercise and the diet and the motivation to, to get there. Yeah. yeah. Testosterone makes you want to do more work. And it makes the work feel right? a bit easier. And, and all <laughs> hormones, right, they work in the brain. The end yeah. target order is really the brain. And so we get that in there and suddenly, and I do a, pro, a challenge test in my office. So when I look at the data and I say, oh, okay, they're pretty low. Let's see how they feel in the next 15 minutes. And so we can take a sublingual wash and put it under the tongue right? Give it 15 minutes. Cheeks get rosy. Eyes light up. They're more alert. They're looking around the room and I'll go, the how do you feel right now? And they're like, I, I don't remember the last time I feel like felt like this. Well, boom, there's your answer right, right there, mm. right? As soon as that testosterone gets to the brain, lights that up, they're very alert. Plumber. Can that be someone's monotherapy if it's just a sublingual testosterone? Is that something that you... I, I use all the delivery methodologies yeah. except for pellets. I used to use pellets, did them for about a decade, and then I stopped doing them, I think, in around 2010, 11, maybe yeah. somewhere in that time frame. They're just not physiologic. It was not a favorite delivery methodology mm. for me. Sure, there are docs that can make that delivery methodology work, and I think for certain patient population subgroups, they're good. I don't like them. I don't like the expulsions. I don't like having to do a procedure on a regular yeah. basis. Um, they can be extruded. They can get infections. If you're doing them long enough, you move from one hip to the other mm -hmm. hip, then they come to the front. And if women are wearing bikinis, it gets in the bikini line. Yeah. Uh, there, but there are doctors like uh, Dr. Elizabeth Glazer does a fantastic job using pellet therapies. And her work is incredible with respect to okay. you know, uh, testosterone being apoptotic to breast cancer cells. So there are, there are those yeah, we've doctors. Heard that. That, yeah, that, I, I did a talk about um, the Met Police years ago. They asked me to talk about HRT, and, and one of the, the studies I found was, you know, how testosterone will help mitigate breast cancer for, for mm -hmm. women. It should be part of the HRT in, in, in early, women. Yeah. And early on. Yeah. So it's, it's really incredible. So the other area I want to talk about is the linkage with autoimmune disease and low testosterone. What have you found with autoimmune disease in the two? So anecdotally, yeah. I, I can't give you any literature yeah. right now, but without a doubt, especially in the young female population, okay. I see a lot of autoimmune disease and it spills over into thyroid disorders yep. and low testosterone. And why is that? So you take the average 20 something year old female on birth control pills, 
what do the birth control pills do? Sex hormone binding goes up, testosterone, free testosterone goes down, many tastes down to zero, puts them in a catabolic state. They over exercise, right? Because, yep. And they all want to run. They don't lift weights. They run because they want to be skinny, right? Yeah. And they under eat. They stress themselves out, maybe drink too much alcohol. Perfect storm. Then add in environmental toxins, mm. right? Yes. And now it's just a recipe for disaster. And they end up with these all these induced autoimmune problems, right? And so what I found is in this subgroup, for example, straightening out their diet, you know, now feeding them up, right? So they're not chronically yeah. underfed, reducing the amount of exercise, changing the type of exercise that they do. Mm. And then if you're going to put someone in birth control pills, you have to monitor their testosterone. And if it bottoms out, you need to replace it. To me, putting them on birth control pills means more likely than not, you're going to have to use testosterone in the background. Because you have to take oh, them out of that see, catabolic yeah. state. You have to make them anabolic, right? There's nothing that you're going to do with food or exercise that's going to bring that up. Now, you can change the birth control pills, something less estrogenic, right. a lower progesterone, and things it's still like effective that. for the... Sometimes with some clients yeah. it is, but more often than not, you're going to find in order to have their testosterone come up, they have to come off the birth control pill. Well, how many are they going to do that? So you just add testosterone <laughs> in. And right. you can, so right. that's actually fascinating because... You know, for for a younger man, they're not going to say, "Hey, talk about birth control. Can I have some testosterone, please?" <laughs> uh, but uh, it's okay. And there's always a concern for what young men if we don't want to put them on testosterone, at least in the traditional like NHS philosophy, because it'll shut down the pituitary axis, and therefore, you know, we cause that 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 damage. But yet, women are essentially are they not shutting down their hypothalamic pituitary axis by going birth control? It, it's that's exactly what's happened, right? <laughs> they shut it down. You've yeah. now made them doctor. You have now made them <laughs> catabolic. And, and you put them at greater risk for all the metabolic diseases under the sun by yeah. putting them on a birth control pill. First, do no harm. Uh, so, and most docs don't understand that when they put them on birth control pills, they're creating a catabolic state. And what are you going to do to get them out of that? So then you have that testosterone. Now, not and, every and well, female has an issue, yeah. but it certainly, you know, it certainly plays out. And I see it all the time. They come to my office. And I'm like, well, look, here's your free testosterone. In big red numbers, 0.0, wow. 0 like yeah. nothing. So what are you going to do to address that? You know, I'll, I'll come in complaining of, oh, I got weak muscles. I got no get up and go. Yeah. Something feels off. They feel a little instability from a mood standpoint because their copper levels are really high now. So birth oh, control yeah. pills explode copper levels, right? So zinc comes down, copper goes up, and they feel a little, 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 <laughs> little nutty, in yeah. it, right? So what are you going to do about that? And it creates an, an interesting conundrum, right? Yeah. On the opposite side, when you talk about young men, I'll tell you now, 2012 and before, I never saw anybody under the age of 40. Never. Now it's every week, 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. And it's crazy. They'll have the lowest testosterone levels I'll ever seen, 195, 89, and you know, I'll screen them and there's no reason for it to be there other than maybe they're using ADD medication, mm. antidepressants, anxiolytics, yeah. smoking too much marijuana, right? Those things will just bottom it out. And they'll complain they've never had an erection or they don't get erections and they've not had sex. And these are young men who should be, you know, having yeah. sex like rabbits. Yeah, top of the game. Yeah. <laughs> right. Should be chasing tail and they're not doing it. And it's very disturbing. So the approach I'll take with them is usually very different. Oftentimes it means getting them off the medication to see if we can recover the hypothalamic pituitary testicular right. axis. Because those medications work in those very intimate structures. And sometimes they recover and sometimes they don't. So are we going to use HCG? Are we using clomiphene? Are we going to use testosterone? Right. It really creates a conundrum. Like, holy smokes, I've got an 18-year-old in front of me yeah, with testosterone, a 102. That's crazy. That's right. So you can uh, go to his website. And uh, if you would like the channel, leave your comments for Dr. Rob. And You can always find me on Instagram, too. Instagram. Doc, yep, Dr. Rob, common Eric. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you can, I'm but, just yeah. a little bit heavy, but not much. But anyway, thank you, Dr. Rob. Yeah. All right. Take Great. care.